There was a nice cartoon in the New Yorker recently. Three hooded death figures with scythes. And one of them is lying dead on the ground. And one of the other ones is saying to the third one, you never think it's going to happen to you. Most of us go through life like that, and yet it happens to everybody. Most people don't like to think about it because they think there's nothing you can do about it. They're, you might say they're fatalistic about fatality. You die, you just die. That's it. But the Buddha realized that there's a skill, because the death is not the end, and how you manage your death is going to play a large role in what happens after death. This is one of the reasons why we practice, one of the reasons why we contemplate those five re reflections that so often we're subject to aging, illness, and death, separation. These things are all inevitable. But then we have our karma. That's what makes a difference. Now, for most of us, our karma is simply we want more. That other chant we do frequently, like we did just now. The world is swept away, it does not endure, offers no shelter, there's no one in charge. It's nothing of its own, and yet we're all slave to craving. We want to keep coming back for more and more and more. That's the problem. But we can learn how to gain some control over that craving, at least. And at best, of course, put an end to it. Before we put an end to it, though, we need to get some control over it. This is why we meditate, because there is a skill. The Buddha talks about the things that you have to watch out for as death comes, and there are two big ones. One is worry. Your own worry about yourself, what you're facing. You're worried about the people you're leaving behind. You're concerned about leaving behind the pleasures of the human realm. And then there's sensuality, our attachment to those pleasures. And as we're practicing meditation, we're learning how not to fall for these things. Regard them simply as hindrances coming up in the mind. No matter how insistent they may seem that you really want a particular pleasure or that there's something you really have to worry about, you have to tell yourself that you don't need those things. And as for the best preparation for the future, it's gaining more discernment, gaining more concentration, gaining more mindfulness. Because you don't know what's going to happen in the future, but you do know that when unexpected things come, the more mindful, alert, discerning you are, the more likely you are to be able to handle these things well. And the more you have the ability not to get knocked over by these events. One of the biggest problems is the narratives we tell ourselves. Now, the narrative of death is a very upsetting one. But we don't have to tell ourselves a narrative. That's another thing that practice does. We, as we're developing concentration, we start out by trying to be with just the body, feelings, and mind just in and of themselves, before we turn them into issues, before we turn them into narratives. This is what the in and of itself is there, before we turn them into the ordinary becomings of daily life. What you want to do with this body, what kind of feelings you want, how you're going to go, go about getting them, the attitudes that come up in the mind, the stories they tell. We try to get the body, feelings, and mind before they've turned into becomings, when there's still just a potential for becoming, and we turn them into a becoming with concentration, which doesn't have narratives. If you're asked, what was the narrative of your concentration? Well, I watched this breath, and then I watched that breath, and then I watched that breath. It's a pretty dull narrative. And the point is not in the narrative. You don't have to remember all the breaths that you watched. You just remember to be with each one as it comes. And trying to breathe in a way that's skillful. Trying to find whatever pleasure or potential for pleasure there can be in that breath. Give the mind something good to stay with so it's not hungering after those old narratives. But still, it's just the breath in and of itself, the body in and of itself, not the body as you might wonder about 
whether it's good looking or not, whether people will like it or not, whether it's strong enough to do this or that job. It's just the fact you've got a body right here. That's it. It's just a body. It's just feelings, just mind states, without all the fearful narratives. And that's your refuge. The Buddha talks about taking the Dharma as a refuge, and it's establishing mindfulness in this way. That's your refuge, because it helps pull you out of the narratives that would make things overwhelming. There's a lot of drama that can happen around death, but death can also be without drama. And that's our choice, but, and that's the skill we're trying to develop. That's the other part of it. Meditating is there's not much drama about sitting and watching your breath. Like that other New York cartoon, this woman is talking to a friend, and you see in the background you see her, the woman's husband sitting and meditating. And she's complaining to her friend, my husband used to be such an interesting neurotic before he took up meditation. The meditation is much better for you, but there's no drama. There are people who live for the drama, but then the drama can overwhelm them. I know an author who wrote a book about infidelity, on a large scale. This one man was very unfaithful to a lot of women, and then she herself found that her husband was cheating on her, and she couldn't take it. She committed suicide. It's one thing to like the drama just for the, the taste, as they say in Indian aesthetic theory, where you're not actually experiencing what the characters are experiencing. You're just tasting their emotions in a, at a distance, which makes it interesting. And, but when, when things like that actually happen to you, you find it's overwhelming. That's not what we want. We want to learn how to keep the mind from being overwhelmed. The Buddha talks about feelings invading the mind and remaining. And what he means is that the feelings overwhelm you. And he trained himself so that he was not invaded by the feelings, and it was not over they didn't remain. A feeling would come and it would just go, kind of wash off his back, like water off a duck's back. How do you do that? Well, it's by developing this refuge of, of mindfulness. The Buddha has an image of the, the practice of being like a fortress. You've got mindfulness as the gatekeeper. Oh, that keeps unskillful thoughts from coming in, tries to recognize the unskillful ones. has three functions altogether. One is remembering to stay in the present moment, and two, recognizing what's coming up, learning to label things as skillful and unskillful. Rather than my narrative, it's this is an unskillful thought of this particular variety. And once you recognize what variety it is, then you know what to do with it. That's the third function, which is to remember how do you deal with unskillful thoughts in an effective way? How do you effectively give rise to skillful qualities? That's what mindfulness does. It protects the fortress at the, at the gate. And if it happens to let somebody in, then you've got the soldiers inside. There's a right effort. In other words, if something unskillful does come into the mind, you do your best to get rid of it. And then you've got concentration, which is the food that keeps the soldier strong, keeps the gatekeeper strong. And at the same time, the soldiers and the gatekeeper are protecting the, the stores of food. They don't want the food to get stolen. So these are the qualities that see you through, the easier protection. And then the fortress itself has a foundation stone or foundation post, excuse me, which is conviction. The conviction is that your actions really will matter, which is why we're not fatalistic about fatality. When death comes, we know there is a skill. And the actions you've been developing, the skills you've been developing through your meditation, through your practice, are going to see you in good stead. As long as you have that conviction, you do get more skillful in your actions. 
And finally, the sermon is the wall. It's covered with plaster, they say, so that the enemy can't get a foothold. You throw the enemy out, and they, your discernment keeps them out. That's your refuge. But the key to all this is to get things before they turn into the narratives of becoming that make the events overwhelming. See, this is just the body. This is what the body does. It's going to die inevitably. So we have to prepare for that. So when it comes, we're not knocked out of line. So, okay, the time has come. Okay, this is how, what you do when that time has come. You've been prepared. It's just body, it's just feelings, just mind states. And that way the mind can go on to whatever opportunities it has. And if you do it well, then you go to a place where you have more opportunities to practice, which could be the human realm, could be the, the realm of the devas. Sometimes you hear that it's only on the human realm that people can practice the Dharma. That's not true. Devas can practice too. So if any of those realms open up with an opportunity to practice, and you're not able yet to completely let go, it still counts as a skillful death. So we're working on these skills, seeing the hindrances as hindrances rather than as more interesting stories to follow. Learning to develop our fortress inside with its gatekeeper and its soldiers and its food. So even though we don't look for death when it happens to come, we're ready for it. We can approach it with skill, realizing that that will make a huge difference. <laughs>